Hi everyone and welcome to my first webinar for the year. I'm really excited that you can join. I'm sorry for those who signed up for the previous date and that we had to reschedule but hopefully that means more people could join today. So today we're going to be covering basic strategies to assess stocks. This is aimed at beginners assuming that you maybe know a little bit about the stock market, perhaps you've bought your first stock, but more likely you're just thinking about it. And hopefully this year will be the year where, you know, you dive in and you potentially buy your first stock. So just to sort of get an idea of where everybody is on their journey, I'm just going to launch a quick poll to see where everybody is. If they have bought plenty of stock, if they've bought no stock, if you don't mind filling it in, it'll just give me an idea. So that'll be great. I'll just give a few more seconds. I'm not going to pause too long on this. All right. So a good, a good mix of experienced and beginner investors. So before I begin, I have to start by saying that this whole presentation today is for education purposes only. Nothing of what I'll be saying will be financial advice. It's only a recommendation and my own experience. So as always, please make sure that you find a tax or a financial advisor before you make any decisions. But yeah, it's just for educational purposes. If anybody has any questions as we go along, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Although I'm going to be talking a lot, I'm hoping that this can be quite interactive. So please feel free to raise your hands or ask questions if you have any questions about anything that I'm going over. I am assuming many of you know me from eToro. If you don't know me from eToro, I'm one of eToro's most copied popular investors. I have over 175,000 followers. Like many of you, I started my investing journey out of pure frustration that I wanted to grow my wealth, but I was resisting paying a management fee, even if it was one or two percent in my early 20s. So even though I'm an engineer by training, I have over the last decade honed in on my skill of investing. I now have the CC qualification and I'm focusing full time on being a eight or a popular investor and doing more educational content to hopefully inspire or empower others to take the first plunge if that is where you are in your journey. As I mentioned, I'm doing more talks and hosting more events to try and disseminate more information and to make investing more accessible because one of the things that I found when I started looking for a platform to invest was a is the jargon that tends to be used in the industry it can be quite excluding a lot of people if it's not your field or you don't know what's going on. And then secondly, is just finding the right information to make a decision. So I'm hoping to get more people to start sooner, basically. So today we're going to be going over how I selected my first investment. And hopefully that'll give you some tips and tricks of things to avoid because I did make a lot of mistakes initially. Then we'll go over some basic strategies that you can use to evaluate stocks. And then finally, just go over a few golden rules when you're thinking about creating your portfolio or picking your first or your next stock for your portfolio. So firstly, my financial journey, some of you may have seen the slide previously. So as I mentioned, I was very fortunate. My parents started, I wouldn't say forced, but encouraged us to put small amounts of any prize money, pocket money, gifts that we got from a very, very young age. I'm talking about like four or five to put that into mutual funds. But then by the time I was in my early 20s, I had the luxury of noticing that those mutual funds had grown without me doing anything. And so I became quite curious about the potential of investing and specifically investing in single stocks, choosing my own stock portfolio. And because I did a back of the envelope calculation about the fees that they were charging, which was only one or two percent, to manage the portfolio, I realized that since I was still quite young, over the sort of 40 plus year time frame that I had ahead of me at that point, I could 
probably double my money by not paying those fees. And so I started aggressively looking for platforms that I could invest on. Etoro was not my first platform. And if you want to look more into why I chose Etoro, I've recently made a video about that. I would say if you are on Etoro and you're happy with it, that's absolutely great. If you're on a platform that you're not happy about or you find that you're not using it, make sure that you make that shift because I wasted a lot of time personally personally trying to use a platform that just wasn't working for me and I do regret the six months I spent trying to figure that out because it could have shifted this whole thing forward by six months. So in 2016 I found eToro and this is my history on eToro but you could see that it was a pretty steep downward curve and that's because when I first joined eToro I was really eager to learn, had a lot of ideas about what investing was about and so I did the fatal mistake of starting my very first thing that I bought on Doro was actually oil. And yeah, the reason that was a mistake was because back then I didn't know anything about commodities. I didn't understand enough how it worked. And so I was basically buying something because I was impatient, because I read online that, you know, like oil fluctuates a lot. And I thought I could learn quickly because it fluctuates a lot and also make money faster which is the classic initial mistakes for any investor but fortunately I'm a fast learner so fortunately I didn't stick to that strategy I'm not a donkey so I didn't keep banging my head against the same wall I started exploring other stocks I started buying mostly tech stocks because as you know I'm a mechatronics engineer by training but I was doing my PhD in machine learning at the time and so I started buying things which I understood which was either related to tech or healthcare I was doing biomedical engineering so yeah I just started buying things that I understood and that sort of when this curve or, or change in my portfolio performance started happening but I did pay for that for a long time it took quite a while until my portfolio had made up the loss that I had incurred from that early it was only a, a short few months but it took me nearly a year to sort of start making profit so I also neglected to mention because this is a, quite an important point is that I started my portfolio with $300 on eToro and that was simply because it was an amount that I felt comfortable potentially losing I called it my school fees when I embarked on this journey and I'll, for a number of reasons, that amount wasn't enough because back then on eToro, the minimum trade position was $50, which meant with the minimum trade of $50, I could buy six different stocks, which doesn't really give you a lot of wiggle room in your portfolio. We'll talk a bit about how to think about the number of stocks that you include, but six definitely wasn't enough for me to have, you know, that rotation in my portfolio. Now you could probably do it with $300 if you're pressed, probably even 100 because they have reduced the minimum trade to $10. So that's fantastic. But yeah, and then it took me probably another two years to refine my strategy until I started, you know, pulling away from my benchmark, the S&P. And as you can see here, sometimes the goal is not to win more than the, your benchmark, but just to lose less. And that comes through a well-diversified portfolio. So Based on your financial journey, what are sort of the things that I recommend you should think about when you start investing? So I know some of you here have indicated that you already have numerous stocks. It would be, you know, quite interesting to hear how you went about it. But at the same time, you'll also pick up a trend today, and that is that investing is not really a static process. It's a, a constantly evolving process, not only is the market which we operate in evolving but you as an investor also evolve your knowledge your understanding your tolerance evolves as you go through your investing journey but perhaps also your goals and your life milestones sort of evolve I realized when I made the slide it should have probably been a circle because it is a constant a loop that I believe you should go through when you are investing so the first step I always recommend is to start as soon as possible. And this is not really age dependent. As I mentioned, I was fortunate. I started in my early 20s. But as soon as possible is really just 
today. If you couldn't do it yesterday, then the next best day to do it is today. And I used to recommend when people ask me how to get started on these type of webinars, I used to highly recommend the eToro virtual account where they give you, I think, $100,000 and you get to play with it without having to put your real money. I still recommend that. I, I still use it to test some of my strategies. But what I found, unfortunately, is when I come back to people months or even years later and ask them, how it's going with their investing journey, they're often still stuck in that virtual account. They, you know, are sort of uh, reminiscing about the money they, they could have made or the money they could have lost in that virtual space had they transitioned to the real investing or the real account. So I no longer really recommend for you to start there because I think a lot of people get stuck there. And it's just about getting some skin in the game because a very big thing about investing is how you manage your emotions. And there's really no way to learn that then on the job, basically, when you have some of your own money in the stock market and you're seeing it either go up or go down. The second thing is to decide how much you want to invest. And again, this is a very personal decision based on what stage of your life you're in, what you're sort of dedicating to this journey. So for me, I had some other investments and picking individual stocks was an absolute learning curve initially. And so it was a few hundred dollars that I was willing to dedicate initially. Now that looks very different for me because I do it full time. I'm much more experienced. And yeah, I just I'm just much more comfortable with managing all of my money versus a small amount of it. So yeah, this would really be up to you to decide how much you're willing to invest, but more importantly, even how long you're willing to fix that money for, because we have to remember that investing is a long-term journey. And here we're talking about 10 years plus probably. So think about the money you're able to, I mean, hopefully you're not going to lose it because we're here to learn how to make profits. But the reality is that it might be stuck. And one very terrible thing I often see is people trying to get their money out, either from their copy position on eToro or just liquidating positions that they have because they need that money for something else, either an emergency or they just haven't planned for that money to go towards the deposit of a house or starting a new business. And while life sometimes happens and we can't plan for everything, it is important to consider those things when you are deciding how much you want to invest because it will just give you that little bit of buffer to liquidate or sell those stocks when the market is in favorable conditions rather than when you have to sell them. So that's why it's really important to just have a think about that. Then the third thing is to actually open the investment account because this is also where a lot of people, including myself, get stuck for a long time. Nowadays, it's easier than ever. You can do it from home. You can even do it from your smartphone. It'll only take you a couple of minutes. Maybe if you're like me, you open multiple different ones and see which one you like. But the most important thing is that you actually start to open the account and deposit some money in it. The fourth thing, which we'll talk about more in detail, because it's really important for determining the strategies that you use to assess stocks, and that is to pick an investment strategy. It's really important. This is the whole thesis that underlies every decision that you make related to your portfolio. And it's got a few core elements that we'll go through, but it's really important that you take some time to think about that because those strategies can vary. They can be really conservative where you just want a low risk strategy and you're focusing sort of on wealth preservation or it can be really aggressive where you're really going and focusing on capital appreciation. But the most important thing about the investment strategy is to remember that it's not static. As I mentioned, we, we all evolve not only as investors, but life also takes us through different phases. So when you're towards the end of your career, your investment strategy will very likely look quite different from when you're early in your career, or if you have some you know, fixed milestones coming up, 
then your investment strategy would likely change and evolve. So it's important to keep reviewing it. And I say this because a lot of people also get stuck on this. They think it's this big thing that they have to get it right. And as adults learning something new, when we get so focused on getting it right, that often paralyzes us to taking action at all. So just remember that it is pretty important because it'll help you make all the other decisions, but it's not a static thing. It will evolve. And then finally, number five is to understand your investment options. So we're here today to talk about how to assess stocks, but you have other options. As I mentioned, I've had mutual funds, you have ETFs, perhaps you want to get a basket and it doesn't have to be an either or. It could be a different exposure for your portfolio based on what you want to achieve. For example, on my portfolio on eToro, I use, even though I predominantly pick individual stocks, I sometimes use ETFs or index trackers on the platform to either get exposure to something that I can't get otherwise. For example, I really want to have in my portfolio to the Indian market. I have a hypothesis based on what's happening in China. I think there's a lot of favorable conditions in India. And so I want my portfolio to have exposure to that region. However, Itoro doesn't have a lot of Indian stocks or Indian companies on their platform. They don't have access to the Indian stock market, but they do have an ETF that has a basket of stocks from there. And so I use that ETF in my portfolio to get access to those stocks. So that's just an example of how you might use different asset classes based on what your objectives might be in your portfolio. So how do you pick your first stock? As I mentioned, the underlying thesis that will determine how you pick your first stock, your second stock, any stock actually for that matter, will be your investment strategy. And this is because it really dictates every decision that you're going to make, not only when you buy a stock, but also more importantly, when you sell a stock, because this is something I see very often. People will often buy a stock because either they read something in the news or the friend bought it or whatever. They, they ended up buying a stock, but now they don't know when to sell that stock. They don't know when to get rid of that stock. And so this is where your investment strategy essentially comes in to help you assess when to acquire, but also when to dispose of stocks. So the three main components of an investment strategy, and it doesn't have to be a formal document that you set up, but I do recommend that you sort of just jot it down somewhere. I think it's a really important thing to come back to, especially when the market becomes volatile for you to remember perhaps why you bought that stock, why you want to hold on to it, or what you're trying to achieve. So the first thing will be to consider your risk tolerance. And that's really easy. Just Google risk score, investment risk score. And there's tons of questionnaires online that you could fill out. It'll take you a few minutes. But understanding your risk score is quite an interesting exercise because it might be different to, you know, what you think it is. For example, I thought I was a lot more risk taking than I ended up being in my risk score. And so that could enable me to adjust my portfolio goals according to, you know, what I feel comfortable with in terms of the risk that I'm willing to take in exposing my finances to the stock market. So get your risk score. The second thing is to think about your goals. As I mentioned, this could be different for everybody and it could also be different at different stages in your life. So if you are at the end of your career and you're about to retire, then your goal might be to have a pure income portfolio. You no longer care about capital appreciation. You just want to generate a good income for the rest of your life. Or perhaps you want a deposit for a property or you want to send your children to a university, whatever, you might have some financial goal that you're trying to achieve. Those often, but not always, link to the next one, which is a time horizon. So that might be the lead time you have until you have that future capital need. So these things are important because it dictates what sort of stocks you'll buy, 
when you'll sell them, how many different stocks you'll have, but probably more important, what will be your asset allocation by sector and also by type. Because, for example, if you want fixed income, you'll probably go for something that gives more dividends or you'll gear more towards bonds or look at your portfolio slightly differently based on that. So that's why it's important to just have a little bit of a think about what your investment strategy is, because that really does underpin what you're trying to achieve in your portfolio. So just as an example, this is my investment strategy, and it has two layers. The first layer is what I call the basics. The second layer is what I call me. But what makes this unique is the combination of these things, which is unique to me. So the first thing is my portfolio is a long-term equity portfolio focused on compounded growth. So I tend to buy slightly more volatile growth stocks, and I tend to reinvest, not tend to, I do reinvest all of my profits. So if if you're after an income generating portfolio, that's not what my portfolio is going to give you. The second thing is decision and risk management. So as I mentioned, understanding your risk appetite can allow you to manage that and reduce your risk. As I mentioned, I'm in the middle of the spectrum and my portfolio reflects that. I'm a medium return, medium risk portfolio. That's not to say I don't have any crypto, but I'm certainly not like an all crypto kind of person. And understanding that risk appetite allows you to make these decisions about the type of stocks and the type of assets that you put into your portfolio. The next one is the use of strong fundamentals. That's just, again, we'll talk about fundamental and technical analysis. The second layer is what I call the uniquely me. So the first part is, as I mentioned, I have a PhD in machine learning. So as part of my technical analysis, I use AI and machine learning. This is not a requirement. This is different for everybody, but this is me. This is how I see the world. This is how I interpret data. And so rather than trying to force myself to use some technical analysis tools, which I don't feel comfortable with or I don't know, I use what the tools that I know basically. And, and this will be different for everybody. If we go through some of the strategies, maybe there's one that resonates with you that you sort of lean on a lot more heavier when you are putting together your portfolio. The second one, as I've mentioned before, if you haven't picked this up about me, I absolutely loathe fees when it comes to investing. I don't think people realize at all how much they eat into your profits over the long term. And so that's one of the reasons I chose the eToro platform, because it could allow me to test different strategies without paying exorbitant fees. And I try and pass that on to my copiers just because I'm so obsessed with not having any fees in the portfolio. And the final thing is my way of seeing the world. So it's what I call the hive mind. It's using social feeds. It's how we look at the world. And, and that's the unique thing I think we have to realize about investing is that there is no right answer. It's all about market perception. It's all about how you interpret a specific piece of data versus how I interpret it and the decision both of us make based off that data. And that's where the opportunity lies in the market because if I read a piece of news and I interpret it as positive, sometimes it's very obviously positive or negative, but sometimes there's these gray areas where one person might interpret it as a positive signal and somebody else interprets it as a negative signal. But if you're aware of those biases and those lenses that you use to view the world, you can sort of be aware of how you can use them when you are doing your analysis or when you are picking a stock. So now let's get to some of the strategies that we can use to evaluate stocks. So we'll go into a bit of detail today, but as I mentioned, this is a beginner's course, so I'm not going to overload you, hopefully, with too much information. But as I mentioned, I am a strong proponent of democratizing information. And if you are choosing to participate in the stock market, it is an old system which existed long before any of us. And so there are some terminologies that we should be familiar with. You may hear them, you may disregard them, you may never use them, but it just helps you to not feel so overwhelmed when you do get different information coming at you. So the two main pillars for evaluating a stock 
On the one hand, we have the fundamental analysis. So that gives us qualitative and quantitative factors to view the world. It looks at the company. It looks at the industry that the company is operating in. It looks at the macroeconomic climate that these companies and industries operate in. And it tries to predict future profits. But the core goal here is to determine the intrinsic value, because basically you're trying to decide whether that stock is worth what face value of it is, if it's a good buy or not, essentially. And so that's the goal of fundamental analysis. And that's probably more widely used in long term investing. On the other side, we have technical analysis, which tends to be used a bit more with short term trading. And that looks at the price data. It looks for patterns in the data. And it looks for buy and sell signals, essentially. That's when you hear people use terminology like it's hit a resistance or this it's about to break out. Those are sort of the terminology. And you'll often see graphs full of lines and arrows. We'll go through some of the basic methods, but it's really not a main part of what I'll cover in the course today. I personally use a combination of both. I'm a data scientist. I love data. And so I think if there's any data left on the table that I can use to make a decision a more informed decision, I will grab it with both hands. But when I started, I started purely on the technical analysis side. As I mentioned, I have a machine learning PhD, so I relied heavily on that technical analysis of pattern recognition and price predictions. But over the last decade, I've sort of evolved into a hybrid method where I use both of these. It really will depend on the situation and the stock which one I lean on more heavily. So if we look first at the fundamental analysis, as I mentioned, the goal here is to estimate the intrinsic value of the stock. You're essentially wanting to decide what is the thing worth that you're going to buy and are you paying a good price for it? So that's what you want to decide because you ideally would like to buy it for under the market value or fair face value. So in terms of qualitative factors for fundamental analysis, the very first one is company news. And that's any news which is related to the company that can cause the price to either go up or go down. And that's just because when there's good news, people tend to buy stocks. And when there's bad news, people tend to sell stocks. And if we know anything from economics and supply and demand, if the market is being flooded with supply, the price tends to go down. So if a lot of people are selling based on bad news, we expect the price to go down and vice versa. The second one is any personnel changes that can come out from the company. And the reason any of these sort of management structures are important and why investors look out for them is because it does affect the market's perception about the company and the business's reputation essentially can be affected by any of these changes. And as we just mentioned, that has a direct impact on the price of the stock, which is what we're trying to determine here. And then thirdly, is any financial events. So just like individuals are not immune to the larger economic environment that we operate in, businesses are sometimes influenced by events outside of their control. And a very good example of that at the moment is because of inflation and the increase in interest rates, we're seeing lending and debt is becoming more expensive. So in the same way, for example, in the UK, we're seeing a cost of living crisis and people's mortgages are going up. So because the interest rates are going up, people will have less disposable income, which affects the individual's cash flow, essentially. And in exactly the same way, businesses are affected by these larger economic environments. So as interest rates are going up, any businesses with large amounts of debt can be affected negatively by that. Sometimes there's a delay in these events and the actual impact on the stock price. So sometimes you'll see a stock price move and you may not necessarily understand it because it's not an event that happened on the day, but it could be something that happened a while back. And we could potentially expect this with the interest rates going up because a lot of the debt that the companies have 
may currently have agreements in place where the interest rates are currently fixed. So they're not immediately impacted by the interest rate rises, but when they do try to renegotiate those terms and those interest rates go up, their cash flow will be significantly impacted. So those are the qualitative factors that you can take into account as part of your fundamental analysis, just understand what's happening with a stock or the price of a stock. In terms of the quantitative factors, now, again, this is really up to personal preference, what affinity you have. If you're a more quantitative person, you like the numbers, you might gravitate more towards this, whereas other people might gravitate more towards the qualitative factors, because it, it's really up to your individual strengths and how you assess the world. So our first quantitative factor is earning releases. So if you are an investor or you follow investors, you'll know that they always keep a close eye on when company earning reports are coming out because that's a key part of fundamental analysis. And that's purely because if a company's earnings drop and the share price of that company does not adjust to the new level of the predicted earnings or the actual earnings, the stock price might not be reflecting its true value. And so that creates a potential opportunity because either the stock is overvalued or undervalued. And so that's why investors keep a very close eye on earning releases. The second quantitative factor is balance sheets. So a company balance sheet basically just lists all its assets and liabilities, and it does give you a strong indication about how strong or how healthy the, the company is, because it does reflect its potential for earning. And as I mentioned, earnings are really affecting the stock price. Now, the key thing to sort of remember with both of these things that with a bit of creative accounting, these numbers can be influenced and often are influenced in a positive light for the company because it's to their benefit. So it's it's important to understand that there can be some creative accounting that happens on these. So that's why a lot of investors who really obsess about fundamentals will do a lot of their own deep dive into this to make sure that there's not too many discrepancies. But generally, the key is that the more evaluation methods you are aware of or know about, the more opportunity you will have to pick up on these discrepancies because you might hear something about the earnings release, but you know that there is an, a financial event that took place or you know there was a piece of company news that contradicts those two pieces of information. And so a lot of people tend to just do a high level of, of numerous different valuation methods because you can tend to pick up any discrepancies if there are any, not to say that there always is. The third one is dividends. So dividends are the portion of the company's profits that they choose to return to the shareholder, which is you if you're holding that company's stock. And that's just one of the ways where the shareholders can earn money from their investments. Not all companies tend to give out dividends these are often large, very established companies that don't have a lot of avenues for growth. And so rather than keeping those profits on the book, they tend to give out large dividends. UK companies are known for being more dividend oriented companies. And so you could use dividends as one of the factors when you are choosing a stock, because not only does it indicate the profitability of the stock, if it has good future earning potential, but if, for example, you're after some fixed income, in your portfolio, then you might orientate yourself towards more larger dividend paying stocks, if that makes sense. So the next one is probably the gory or more technical one, and that's just the ratios that are used in fundamental analysis. So again, there are numerous ones. I've cherry picked the eight most widely used ones, and I've highlighted the four, which I think if you take anything from today, that these would be the four that, you know, if you use them in combination, you could probably do a fairly good job. And you could verify a lot of these by diving into the company statements and all that if you want to get serious about it. But often 
price to earnings ratio it's calculated and it's available freely on a lot of screening websites or websites. So it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't be overwhelmed by the fact that you have to calculate all of these because some of them are just available off the shelf for you to use and make a decision. More importantly is probably knowing how to interpret them because yeah, as I said, you could get access to them easily, but the question is how do you interpret them? So the first one is price to earnings ratio, and that really just measures the stock's value by showing you how much you would have to spend to make $1 in profit. The PE ratio is often used to compare the value of one stock to another one. So it's, it's a ratio. So I'll give an example in the next slide. And the question is always, what is a good ratio? What am I looking for? one am i looking for 100 where am i on the scale here and the answer is it's relative to what other companies in the sector have used this one will go into because i think this is the one that's most widely used known and probably quoted so the second one is debt to equity ratio and this really just measures a company's debt against their assets and it gives you insight into how the company is performing relative to their competitors so in this case a low ratio would mean that the company gets most of their funding from shareholders they tend to rely more on equity than on debt and it's important again with these ratios to note what's a good ratio and what's a bad ratio and this will tend to differ for different industries. Next one is return on equity, which measures a company's profitability against its equity, and it's expressed as a percentage. So this one might be easier to interpret because we're all familiar with percentages because it's on a scale of zero to 100. And it just really shows you if the company is generating enough income by itself relative to the amount that shareholders have invested. Earnings yield measures the earnings by dividing the earnings per share by the share price. And this is also a value indicator. The higher the earnings yield, the more likely it is that a stock is undervalued. And if you're a value investor, these are the stocks that you probably would be aiming for. Relative dividend yield, this measures a company's dividend yield compared to the entire index. And if you're looking to buy stock, you should consider the relative dividend yield because it can show you if a stock is over or undervalued, again, compared to competitors. Then the current ratio measures the company's ability to pay off their debt, which in the current climate might be quite important. And it shows if the liabilities can adequately be covered by the assets that the company has available. And so there's often a link between this ratio and the stock price. The lower the current ratio, the higher the likelihood that the stock price will continue to go down. So yeah, not one of the top four that, that I've put because it's quite specific, but it is also one to keep an eye on. And then the next one is the price earnings to growth ratio. This one measures the price earnings ratio compared to the percentage growth in annual earnings per share. So if you're deciding on a stock, you would probably consider the PG ratio because it could give you an indication of the stock's fair value. And again, this could be considered in comparison to its competitors. And then finally is the price to book ratio. So this is more for the pessimists amongst us because this measures the current market price of the company against the company's book value. So if the company was to close today, would its book value be able to cover the price? And in this case, a higher ratio than one often indicates overvalued shares so if the share price is higher than the intrinsic value of the stock any one of these can really be influenced by a bit of creative accounting many of these are off the books and can be readily accessed as an already calculated ratio for you to use and interpret and the real important thing is just the more valuation methods you have the easier it is 
to spot any discrepancies. And I've highlighted the four that I think are the four main ratios that tend to overshadowing all the others and are quite widely used. So I'll just go through one example for how to calculate one of these ratios. As I mentioned, a lot of them are freely or publicly available on a lot of websites these days. So it may or may not be that you choose to calculate them yourself. But as always with these things, I think it's important to know where they come from so that you know how to interpret them, essentially. And as I said, the question about whether something is a good ratio or not really depends, like everything in investing. There's no right answer and it really just depends on what aligns with your strategy. What is good for a value investor might not be or definitely will not be appealing for a growth investor and vice versa. And that's why it's important to have different valuation methods in your arsenal or at least if you don't leave today, being able to use all of them, at least you will know to go and look for them, which is, I think, always the most important thing, being able to know which questions to ask, even if you don't have all the answers. So in this example, to calculate the PE ratio for Walmart, in their fiscal year ending 2021, for example, the company reported earnings per share of $4.75. When this example was written, the share price was $139.78. And so to get the PE ratio, you just divide the price, which is 139.78, by 4.75, which gives you a PE ratio of 29.43. Now, is this a good PE ratio? It depends. It depends on the sector. You probably want to look at the other competitors, and that will give you an idea of what is a low ratio, because you want a low ratio that implies a good value for your money. But the range of these ratios varies based on industry. And so it's always good to look at other competitors when you're making this decision. Just a quick over glance on the technical analysis. There are an innumerable number of methods or strategies. I just picked out the basic ones. Some of them you can set up on eToro quite easily if you are inclined to look at price data and the movements and try and identify patterns. Maybe you just find it interesting to look at it. So some of the basic strategies, number one, will be moving average. So the moving average is just used to identify the trend of a price without the interference of some of these short-term spikes. So here you can see that the moving average is this red line. So now you might say, why is there a red line, a gray line, and a green line? I thought there's only one moving average. While the moving average would dictate over what period you're doing it. So a popular example is 200 days. So you'll use the average of the last 200 days and then move that by one day, move that by one day, the next 200, the next 200. Or by 365 if you want to do a whole year, seven if you do the average by week. So that's why you can get different moving averages. Then the exponential moving average gives more weight to more recent data. And that's useful because if you're looking at a particular long time frame, it might be more useful to give more weight to more recent price data just because the economic environment or the condition of the company is more comparable to the current existing conditions. And so that's why it might be useful to use this. In this case, popular moving average timeframes are 12 days, 26 day trends. And then for long term indicators, 50 day or 100 day are quite popular. And then the third one is standard deviation. So standard deviation helps traders to measure the size of price movements. And this really just relates to how volatile a stock is or how volatile the price might be in the future. And this is important to look at because if something is really volatile and you're trying to put together a low risk steady ship, then choosing a very volatile stock will disrupt your entire portfolio. So what are the next 
steps for you? Should you now go out and buy multiple screens, sign up to multiple subscription services, quit your career and just dedicate yourself to sitting in front of the computer all day and analyzing these things? I mean, fortunately, that's not the case. Fortunately, that's why we're here to say that this is, I mean, this is if you're doing it professionally and if you're managing a big portfolio, but you don't need to do that to have a game plan to buy your first stock or buy your first number of stocks to create your own investment portfolio. So I've put together a bit of a game plan of how you can implement practically the things we've talked about. So the number one thing I always say is to trade the news and not your friend. So don't buy what your friend is buying. Buy the things that you understand buy things that you use. So if you're using a particular type of phone, maybe it makes sense for you to buy those companies' stocks because without being personal or rude to anybody, we're all just average consumers. So if we are consuming a certain product, it's very likely that you're already supporting that company. And so if you already believe in that company, so it would make sense if you then just buy something that you know to begin with until you have a better understanding. Then the second thing is to know your entry and exit strategy. So this will be dictated by your investment strategy. For example, if you have decided that you're going to buy a stock and you're going to sell it when you've made 10% profit, regardless of how you feel at that future point in time, once you hit that, if that is in line with your investment strategy and your goal, you have to execute that. You have to take that 10% profit even if you think it's going to go up to however many percent. And that's the most important thing is to know when you want to get into certain stocks, but also when you want to get out. The third thing is to use simple tools. As I said, there are plenty available. Today, the average investor has access to more information than hedge fund managers had 10 years ago. This can be massively overwhelming, of course, but it's also incredibly liberating for the modern investor to be able to participate, to be able to assess stocks with ease and make decisions about whether or not to include them in your stock portfolio. The third thing is to prepare yourself for volatility because the stock market does go through cycles. And if you have been in the stock market for the last year, you would know how painful it can be when it's going into a recession or going on a steep downward trend. And best thing to do against that is to diversify. Make sure you have a wide variety of stocks in your portfolio. That's why I said don't just have one stock. That's why it wasn't good for me to only have six different stocks in my portfolio. I wasn't diverse enough. Don't just make those six or 10 or 15 stocks all in the same sector. If you buy them from all the same companies in the same sector, that's not diversification. That's just buying more of the same thing with a different label on it. So make sure your portfolio is well diversified to give you some buffer against that volatility. And then number five is to keep investing. That's probably the most important thing. Keep adding money to your portfolio whenever you can. Keep buying stocks whenever they go down. That's what all the seasoned investors are doing at the moment, buying stocks because they're all 20, 30% down. As much as it hurts you and me when you, you're holding them and you bought them a year ago, why not add more? If you still believe in that company, take advantage of dollar cost averaging and just keep adding those stocks. Just buy more of the same stocks that you already have when the price goes down. So my golden rule for investing, and if you've been following me for a long time, you're probably yawning at this point, is patience and discipline. You saw that steep downward curve on my initial learning journey, but you saw the payoff of that. I have personally more than doubled my money that I put into eToro over the last five years, despite having a negative year last year. And that's just because I've been patient, I've been disciplined in sticking to my strategy, reevaluating my investment strategy when the market conditions changed and making sure that I'm constantly reinvesting any profits that I make. 
So finally, what are the key takeaways I want you to take away on your financial journey? Well, the first thing is to just get started. I was delighted to see how many of you indicated on the poll that you have already bought your first or numerous number of stocks. That's amazing. Keep going. Don't let this current market downturn deter you. Uh, and that's the second point. Know that it's a journey. It evolves over time. Your goals will evolve. Your strategy will evolve. And you just need to keep reiterating these basics over a long period of time. So focus on the long term. At least make it comfortable for yourself. Ease out that volatility by making sure that your portfolio is well diversified. So that was a mouthful from me. That was a lot of information. Hopefully some of the tools that I gave will help you. Maybe half of it went over your head, but if at least you've heard of these things before, when you are looking at a stock, hopefully you'll know what to Google and what to look for. I would like to thank everyone for joining. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for joining. And I do hope that if you haven't made your first investment yet that this webinar will at least inch you closer to the point where you do take action to buy that first stock and to grow your investment portfolio.